Welcome to the Cheer Athlete. Today, I'm going to share a clip of a couple of recent webinars that I have uh, put out. And just to give you a taste of what we're, what I'm teaching, um, we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, movement screening and um, warm-ups. And I did a workshop back in the fall about strength and conditioning. So I'm going to put those all together and share that with you. Let me know if you have any questions. If you don't know me, I'm Laura Turner. I'm the cheer PT. I'm a physical therapist, a strength coach, and I help cheerleaders reduce their injuries and improve performance so they can stay healthy and injury-free and keep progressing like they want to safely and happily on that. Um, I appreciate you listening. Uh, if you uh, stay to the end, uh, listen to the end, let me know if you have any questions. At the, uh, if you don't know already, I have a whole list of freebies and guides um, that are available on my website, which will be in the links below. And I did propose in this webinar, um, I'm offering a course, an upcoming program, actually, Feelers and Flexible Flyers, in which you will get a, um, you will learn the warm up, you will learn what, more about joint by joint, and you will learn more strength and conditioning. You'll actually have exercise programs put together for you. If you want more information about that, you can find that in the link below. Also, there was a special webinar price, um, but that price has gone up. So please check that uh, the link and uh, learn more about that. And again, if you have questions, you can reach me at laura at movebetterllc.com. The program starts on July 8th. And we'll have a pre-work uh, week the week before for introductions. So jump on board now and get to know um, get to know yourself better. Learn how you're moving and help your cheerleaders learn to do the same thing. Um, I look forward to seeing you there. And uh, let's get on with the show. Have a great week. What's a good way to cool down? What's a criteria for progressing exercises? And then how can you do this for your cheerleaders effectively? But first. Let's talk about some of those barriers that we talked about before. You doubt a warm up. Move this up top again. Mm -hmm. You doubt a warm up routine is going to help the team. Um, you know, old school way of thinking: stretching's all you need for a warm up. If they stretch before, maybe maybe have them go run and then stretch. Um, because I think the the today's day and age, we know like okay, you got to get the blood flow going first. Um, but then just get in and stretch. And most cheerleaders will come in and just start their stretching and not worry about the, the getting the heart rate going. The new way, um, the warm up is actually part of your workout. There's a lot of research that shows if you, um, if you, you're, we don't have to, it, I think strength training and the, and the separate strength routine is important, but you can include a lot of your strength exercises in your warm up. And uh, that will get the muscles activated, will train the body to move in the way it needs to um, and get the core active and get that going. So if you start to include your warm up as part of that, it will, uh, it will help strengthen muscles. It will improve the flexibility and it will uh, teach better motor control and get the heart rate up and get everybody ready to go. And it doesn't have to be exhausting. It needs to be thorough. Um, it should take 10 minutes, maybe 15 at max. Um, my warmups don't include any running. I think running is a conditioning exercise. And although I don't enjoy running myself, um, and I never did, I do think it's effective uh, for cheer and like, you know, doing intervals in that on um, like conditioning end. That's, the, but as, as a warm up, there doesn't need to be any running. Um, you want to do exercises that are going to actively stretch a muscle. So take it through its full range of motion and um, then also strengthen at the same time. So if you're stretching your hamstrings, you might do a lying down uh, hamstring stretch and then pull the other knee up to join it or do a straight leg raise afterwards. It should include some form of core stability, bird dogs, uh, planks, crawling, uh, inchworms. I love inchworms. <laughs> if you watch my videos on uh, Instagram or TikTok, like, Inchworms are one of the best exercises, and it's the, probably the number one exercise that looks the, the lousiest when kids are doing them because they don't have that core stability and they bend their knees and they're not really getting through and doing an effective stretch and stability um, at the same time, but it covers all bases. Um, 
your warm up, you know, should cover three directions of motion. Uh, you, we, we, our body moves in three planes of motion. It, so you need to be able to twist. You need to be able to side bend, and you need to be able to uh, forward flex and, and extend. And you can include some of these, like the um, Spider Man uh, exercise or the World's Greatest Stretch. That you know, so World's Greatest Stretch, I think, was invented by someone at Exos um, Sport, and he, um, you basically go out into a inchworm into a push up. You bring one leg forward like a Spider Man crawl. You're gonna rotate your trunk and then raise your arm up, and then you're gonna sit back into a hamstring stretch and a, into a lunge. And then you're going to repeat and do the other side. It kind of covers all bases. So you, you hit the different planes of motion with that. This picture here is a, um, it's an anatomy motion exercise. You're going to do a standing stretch and you're going to sit back and step out to different positions um, to work in like a clock position, clock rotation. And you'll hit different portions of the hamstring to help that get looser. So it's important, you know, uh, static stretching has been shown to decrease the, um, it's, it's been shown to inhibit muscles and especially 30 seconds before, um, you do a workout. So if you're going to do a deadlift, um, and picking something up off the ground and you stretch your hamstrings right before that, your hamstrings are actually going to be weaker when you go to pick that deadlift or pick up that weight, um, hamstrings and glutes. So we don't want that weakness when we're going to to do an activity. And we don't want that weakness when we're going to go stunt and jump. We need those muscles to be strong and active and ready to go. So doing more of a dynamic workout is going to help those stay um, strong and help them, uh, you know, help the muscles get through their length and be active and not get inhibited. It is, the research did show that there's, it's really only a 30 second window. So you could take your, you could, you can make a case for, okay, come in, run through the stretches that you feel like you need to run through, go easy because we haven't done a warm up yet, but do them first. If you're going to foam roll, um, I'm not a huge proponent, you know, I, I don't prescribe a lot of foam rolling. There are some times that I like foam rolling, like for shoulders. Um, but if you're going to foam roll, do the foam roll first, then do your stretching and then get into your warm up, like let that so yes they're right come in do your stretching they can get the, through that on their own do what they feel like they need to do and then get into the warm-up i like to start with bridges i like to start with uh uh planks and crawling and interims like i talked about and then get up and do some skipping or some jumping that you know like that takes them kind of creates more of that elasticity to get them ready to get into their actual jump work um you could also schedule in some agility work and some um, uh, different footworks for coordination as well. And put that like at the end of that actual warm up, um, And that that's a great way to kind of get them ready to go and get into their jumps. Um, another barrier that we have, the team gets bored with workouts. They don't want to do the work unless you're, they, and they won't do the work unless you're standing right there, you know, or they're like, oh, we've been doing this, the same exercises over and over again. Um, and they, they're just get, they get bored. So they stop doing them or they put half effort in. Um, a lot of times, you know, they, they don't really think this is an important piece of what they want to do because it's not as glamorous. It's not as fun as getting in an actual cheering and doing, you know, our stunts and our tumbling. Um, but it's an important piece to help make it stronger. So they may not buy into that. Um, and then they're when they don't pay attention and they're not paying attention to what their body feels like, they're not paying attention to what their, their form is. And if you can see on the, the, with this picture, like even here, I'd be cueing her, her back is arched, uh, her back is rounded here, her chin's extended and her butt's up in the air. You know, so cueing and learning to really get a nice, flat, stable back that is a centered position will help to uh, build that strength better. Anyway, make the workouts fun. You see in my workouts, my cats are frequently there. They're really not part of my workouts, but they keep it entertaining for me and hopefully my viewers. <laughs> um and I just can't stop them from jumping into the videos like this dog probably did. Uh, they do add some fun resistance. 
you need to change your workouts every four to six weeks and progress over time. Um, you know, so we need to stay with a workout and be consistent. And yes, it might get boring at the end of that, but you need to stay with those workouts and the same exercises. So your body gets used to it at the beginning of the month. It should be kind of challenging. There should be some soreness or it doesn't have to be soreness, but there might be some soreness that, you know, happens the day after you do a good workout because you're training your muscles, you're moving in a different way and you're asking them to work in this. It's a natural phenomenon. We don't want that to happen, but it does happen. Um, but about four to six weeks, our body gets used to that. And uh, that neuromuscular changes that we were working on um, stops. And that, that motor control, that like that challenge to the brain that says, oh, here's something new. Let's let our body keep working. After about four to six weeks, it goes, okay, this is easy. It's good. And then we stop making those gains. So at four to six weeks, we need to change the workout around. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. I personally like to program, you know, one, like I do two workouts a month and they alternate through the week. Sometimes I'll have them do the same rep range for the first two weeks and then change that. Um, but generally I keep it the same over the course of that four to six weeks. And hopefully they're bumping their rep their resistance up as that goes on. Um, that way they're still progressing and they're still getting a challenge, even though they may not have, um, they're, they're, they're still doing the same work. Um, and then that's six at the four weeks, they change it around. You could change the, you could just change the order of the exercises. You could change the, you know, go from a single leg to a double leg. You could change the surface that they're on. You could go from weighted to body weight. There's, there's a lot of different ways and there's not one right way, which gets frustrating when you're trying to learn and try to program. Um, but having, having a system to, to be able to change that and progress that helps them to not not only not get bored, um, but they keep progressing. And sometimes you throw in like into the warm up, you throw a different exercise in that they have to actually focus on their form and it gets them, them thinking. So it, it makes them, it gets them more creative and it gets them uh, buying in so that they are aware of, you know, where their body's at and what they need to do. Um, you know, you can see, people, you know, clients will say, you know, strength muscles, st new strength workouts will wake up a lot of muscles. Um, it, it may get some talking to your muscles as you change them, but that's always a good thing as long. Well, it's not always, it can be a good thing. It usually is a good thing if you're doing the exercises correctly and it's muscle soreness versus ouch pain. And that's a, that can be a topic for a whole other discussion, but there is a big difference between I use my muscles. I'm super sore. And, oh, I got injured and that's not, that doesn't feel good. Um, and that's an important piece as a coach to recognize, like your kids are going to be sore. And sometimes if they've had a, a hard, even if it's just a hard practice and they're super sore, they might need to just back off the intensity for a day or so to, to let those muscles recover. Because when your muscles are super tired, you're going to fatigue. And then that's when injuries happen. Um, maybe another uh, barrier here is cooling down at practice, you know, takes away from the stunt and tumble time. I would go right to the end. And in high school, you know, parents are waiting. They're like, you know, you told me you would be done at eight. Why is it eight 15? I just wanted to give your kids a little stretch at the end. Um, you only have so much time. I do think it's important to try and, uh, schedule in some stretch time, some, uh, yoga time or, or just some mobility work that's nice and easy and calm at the end of a practice. The best time to do that is right as practice is ending because, or right, you know, before the end of the time of practice, but right as you finish your work and your workouts, because it takes away from your stunt, uh, sorry, because it, you, you've been doing all the work and you need to get the muscles to relax and calm down. And, and that's going to create the most, that's the best time to like increase your range of motion reduce the strain on the tendons and the joints and get things to chill. Um, as far as a workout goes, you know, if you're going to put that into your routine, like if you, if you, especially like the beginning of the year, we're starting to, you know, do conditioning in that, um, not talking like summer practices or summer workouts, but you would do your warm up, then get into your jumps, get into your tumbling, whatever you're going to do for, for cheer practice that day. And then give yourself, you know, at least 20 minutes, you can do an effective work workout in 20 minutes. 20 minutes at the end of your practice, get in your strength work, maybe some conditioning, and then 
program in that cooling down. So five, you don't have to do another warm up again. So you've got 15 minutes to get in and do some strength work and some uh, stretching or some strength work and some conditioning, and then five minutes to get in and have them through stretches. And that way you can wash it, wash the floor, making sure that they're not, you know, when we, I was cheering, we used to have partner stretches and our partners would really push us to our end range and like the knees would flex and we're not getting an effective stretch. Um, so th we didn't know what we were doing, right? So you have the time to watch them if they're doing it at practice and making sure that they're keeping their knee extended as they're going into their heel stretch. Or if I'm not a big fan of splits and you'll hear me talk about it all the time because I don't think they're needed anymore. Even if you're doing a split mount, nobody's down in a hyperextended split anymore. So I'm not a fan of them. And I can see the benefit at the end of practice working on on stretching some split, uh, stretching into your splits because you will get that length through the hamstrings and the hip flexors if they're doing them correctly and they're not just kind of fooling around and, and faking it through it. Um, you know, so so watching them, that's the best time. There is, you know, there if you can't program that time and encourage them when they get home as they're eating their dinner or they're starting to do their homework, that's the time to actually stretch. And they're going to have to go easier because they might have stiffened up on their way home, especially if you're in an all-star program and you're traveling an hour or more to your practice. Um, you know, make sure that you, you know, do it to some easy mobility and then get into some light stretching before bed. And, um, you know, that way at the end of the day, it's okay to get things to relax and calm down. Like that's the best time to get them to stretch. Um, it is important recovery doesn't just happen. You have to do the work. Um, and then stretching absolutely does help muscles to recover after a workout. Uh, you'll frequently hear people say that, you know, uh, that I frequently hear people say, you know, oh, I felt really good. Um, things just kind of calmed down and it felt really a lot looser afterwards. Um, and this was my favorite quote from, from a client of mine who I saw recently uh, because the Wizard of Oz is my favorite movie. And um, so you do, uh, your body knows what you need. Um, and the more we teach ourselves to listen to that, to tune into that, the, the easier that gets. And it's not something that we, it's not instinctive. Like we don't stop and say like, oh, wait, where's that tightness? And if I shift my weight just a little bit here, or if I do this movement, that actually makes it feel better. So your body knows what you need and you have everything you need inside of you. And so do your cheerleaders. You just have to have a way to access that. Um, you might be thinking I'm not qualified to program a workout or to teach someone how to check in with themselves and, uh, know what they're feeling. You know, it's old school way of thought, just power through the exercise. Don't worry about the form lift is, you know, it's important to lift heavy and go hard at it and work out to your puke and just get through it. And, you know, that's going to make it good and strong, but good form sets you up for better strength gains, more power and less injuries. And even if you just slow it down, like if you're, you know, the process, you know, that, um, I, I'm, I'm your biggest fan. Like, you know, you have resources to be able to check what, you know, am I doing this correctly. Um, and, um, uh, you know, are, are they doing it correctly and teaching to have that, uh, form set up will help them to progress as well. So, it, it is important. It actually makes you stronger. If you can do something with, with, uh, uh you'll hear me talk also on, on social media, chin tucked, which means the chin's level. Um, so it's not to be super down, but like you're not sticking your chin up in the air. Your shoulders are out of your ears. Your ribs are, are down the top of that sternum that like right where your chest, where your breastbone is, that's kind of down just a little bit. You're not in a full crunch and rounded forward. It's just down a little and your hips and your pelvis are level. That's a stacked and centered position. That's how we ideally should move around. Every step that we walk, we move in and out of that. So it, it, we're meant to move. We're not meant to just sit up tall. And you know, this is something that people come in all the time. Like, I know I got bad posture. I slouch all the time. Or I know I need to just sit up tall and hold that. But like, we're not meant to sit up tall all the time either. We're meant to move. Our bodies are meant to, to change positions. And when we just sit up tall or we just slouch, you know, our bodies get stiff and then things don't move right. 
setting up and movement learning how to move from a, an, a rib lifted booty out position with the chins really tucked to a super slouched, you know, butts tucked under like Pee Wee Herman and your head comes forward like a chicken and moving in and out of that will help them to, you know, then cue and relax to find neutral and find that more centered position, which when we lift and we need our power and we're gonna go and lift, whether it be a person or it be a heavy weight or even a light weight, picking up a paper clip from the floor, if we can, if we can train our body to find where that center position is, it sets everything up for better, uh, for, for less injury, for better strength and uh, mechanics as a whole. Another key piece in this, and I preach it all the time, is, you know, when in doubt, breathe it out. If you listen to the podcast, you hear me say that all the time. And that's because we hold our breath. If you're presenting like this, or you're coaching, um, or you're in the middle of a cheer routine, you frequently are, and you don't realize it until the end of that two minutes and 30 seconds that you finally can breathe. And then it's, you know, huffing to catch your breath. Now, what happens when we do that all the time and we don't actually train breathing is that our diaphragm gets facilitated. So we have inhibited and facilitated. Inhibited is when a muscle is a little bit weaker. It's not necessarily weakness, but it doesn't react as quick and as strong as we want. And facilitated is, is when it's holding on super tight and it's overworking and it's over contracting and it's uh, never shut never shuts down and doesn't go through that relaxation. We need to move just like we need to move our posture in and out. We need to go from contraction to relaxation. There's always a wave. Balance is always a wave, like finding that balance, like nothing is ever still. Like we, we want good balance for our cheerleaders, but there's never a time when it's completely still, but we, we train the body to move in a way that allows that full motion and creates that centered position, we can hold it steady in a much better stable position. Getting our muscles, to, training ourselves to breathe, getting our diaphragm to work efficiently so that it does relax, allows our abdominals to contract because the abdominals contract when the diaphragm relaxes. It's like a, um, it's like a puffer, um, you know, that like one contracts, the other relaxes. So as the diaphragm relaxes, your core muscles can actually stabilize and control better because they're going to help to push the air out. So when in doubt, breathe it out means you're going to get your core a little bit more stable. And we're not holding a breath and we're not creating more tension through that diaphragm. It allows us to set up better and allows better strength and, and uh, motor control to be able to move forward. I know. How do you start? How do you know? Like, this is what I do, right? I'm a, I, I went to school for physical therapy. I have a background in strength and conditioning and functional strength and conditioning. So if I was not a coach, like even when I was coaching, I wasn't a functional strength coach, but I had the background in exercise and I had done some personal training, um, programs before. Um, but I, I you know, I didn't know either exactly how to, how to start and how to, you know, get going and what to do, um, putting in all the pieces together. Um, and having a way to make sure that the team is doing the work outside of practice and, and knowing what to do and where to go is important. So having an app or a program, there's a, there's a quite a few um, mobility in the areas that need it instead of just pushing through and cranking to try and force a new skill. I enjoy working with clients um, who have been cheerleaders because we can talk the same lingo um, and we know you know, I know how to communicate to them. I know what they're looking for and I know what they're trying to improve to get back to doing. Today's training, like we talked about, we're going to talk about how to screen movement, exercises that will help you, three exercises that will help you improve mobility, stability, and strength. There's a lot more. I'm giving you my three top exercises that I think are very baseline for every cheerleader to do. And then what is a joint by joint approach um, and why it matters. So let's get started. First, we need to deconstruct those barriers. First one is that flexibility is key to better skills. Having better skills doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a better flyer or better flexibility doesn't mean you're gonna be a better flyer. Old school ways, let's stretch, 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 keep pushing the, the stretching that's gonna help you get better. And you believe that flexibility is the answer when in reality, you need a lot of strength to be able to do any of the skills shown here. New way, you need to learn how to move. You need to find out what's missing in your movement and then get specific to exercises that you need. 
I also believe that stretching is the only way to improve. Every every uh, platform I'm on, what stretches do I need to do to be able to improve? Stretching won't help you be better up in the air. The old school way of stretching is to hold a stretch two minutes every day and do it multiple times a day and constantly be holding those splits and uh, getting into the end range of motion. New way, we're gonna rock back and forth from one motion to the other, create a three-dimensional motion. So here we're gonna stretch the inner thigh, we're gonna get some side bend stretch, and then we're gonna get some rotation at the same time. And you move in and out of the pattern so that you can get mobility and strength at the same time. Third limitation and limiting belief that we need to just power through and push and not worry about our form. If you can tell in this picture, uh, this young lady has a big hinge in her lower back and that sets her up for a big risk of injury at that spot in her back. Um, better way to pull this is to make sure we have better hip extension and get the core control, keeping the ribs down. This is a very difficult uh, skill to have. And if we don't have the mobility and the control, it's really gonna set us up for risk of injury. If you're a younger flyer, you may be able to pull this because your body hasn't started to grow yet. And then you might notice as you're changing that it's harder and harder. Instead of trying to crank on it and trying to stretch more, learn how to control the mobility so that you can get there and build the strength in your hip extensors and build the mobility in your hip extension to be able to pull that leg up instead of pulling and cranking through the back. Don't push through compensations you want to uh, and ignore the pain of it. You need to listen to what your body's telling you. The old school way is no pain, no gain. Push to the limits of motion and ignore what the rest of the body is doing. The new way is really look, recognizing that joint by joint approach that we're going to talk about. Look above and below the areas that you think needs to improve and work there. Uh, targeting specific muscles will absolutely help to wake more muscles up, learning how to move properly when you can uh, change how you're moving and allow for a different position, it can change how the tone feels in your body. And like I like to tell everybody, you have everything you need. You just have to listen to what your body is telling you. All right, time to move. Um, we're gonna run through these next couple of slides. You'll be able to stop and go through them. I think that's easier, but I'll talk through them a little bit. Um, I just wanted to, you to be able to see um, some of the different movement screens, but really practice them on your own. And I encourage you, whether you're a parent or coach or cheerleader, try these motions out. Try them and see how they feel in your body. The question that I always ask my clients, well, and the flyers need to learn how to hold better and get tighter. A lot of the flyers were kind of uh, floppy. Uh, we've all seen that, you know, that they don't have that squeeze and really pulling in tight and, and holding together. So strength training can help that. Um, the bases in the back squat, back spots, they need the, the core strength and the, as well as a shoulder and leg strength to be able to power. If you're just pushing things up with your arms and not using your core and your legs, you're going to set yourself up for injury on your back or your shoulders as well. Um, and then it's also, you know, because of all that, there's what the disappointment and the frustration, you could just see it in the kids' faces, you know, that they didn't nail where they wanted to be and they had been practicing things. But when it comes down to a routine time, it's noisy, that adds to distraction. You're tired because you're hyped up and you're going through everything full out. If you don't have that strength and the conditioning to get through a routine, you're going to risk falling and risk injury. Didn't see any injuries occur, so that's all good. But there was, you know, there was a, definitely a lot of falls and things that could be prevented if they were just a little bit stronger. Uh, flexibility wise, I'm going to, I will preach that working on flexibility for chillers is not the primary goal anymore. I do think flexibility is important, but Focusing on stretching for flexibility is not going to make you be able to hold those stunts better. It's not going to get you into like whether it's a flyer or a base to be able to hold yourself up and, and get stronger in that way. Yes, your heel stretch may be higher and prettier, but if you don't have the strength to pull your leg up, then it's not going to be as pretty. 
So we'll talk a little bit more about flexibility. It doesn't mean I don't think that you should never stretch, but I don't think that that's the primary. I, th I think today we need more uh, strength than fo focus on, on flexibility. All right, so what are the main six strength exercises? Uh, a squat, a deadlift, a split squat, which is like a lunge, um, and lunging is part of is an advancement of a split squat to do a push, a pull, and a core. Um, just some basic background on all of these for form. With everything, it's important to, we want to think about stacking your body. So ears over shoulders, shoulders over hips. Um, you will move out of that. So if you're going into a squat, like a sit to stand motion, your hips are going to go back, but your head needs to still be stacked over your shoulders and maintaining that stiff back section. Um, so my cues for everybody is the chin slightly tucked, the back of the neck long, so that we're not getting your chin way out and sticking out this way. Um, so chin tucked, neck long, the ribs down, which means kind of this front sternum pulled down just a little bit, um, and the pelvis relatively level. If we can keep those main core pieces solid in line, the rest of it's all gonna fall in place. The, the ribs down and the pelvis level really gets the core to fire and be more centered in uh, when we're going to do anything. And that's good advice for everybody, not just cheerleaders. Um, in any exercise that you do or while we're sitting, you know, it's okay to move in and out of that. But when you go to lift something, you go to move, you want to think about being in that neutral position. Um, a big thing I see when people are lifting, you know, their shoulders come up into their ears. So really letting the shoulders relax down. And with um, uh, if when looking at your knees when you're squatting, making sure that your knees aren't coming in um, as you're going into a squat. If you do, you may need to, that can be caused either from hip instability or ankle tightness or a lack of core control. So there's a lot of different reasons that that can happen. Uh, with the push and the pull, we're gonna look at vertical motions versus horizontal motions. Um, so a row versus a pull-up, um, there's all kinds of variations there. A For the um, squat and the deadlift and the push and the pull, it's good to do double arm or double leg as well as single leg. For lower body, I think it's extra important to do single leg work because that's going to put a little bit more work into the hip. So a single leg squat um, or a rear foot elevated split squat, uh, single leg deadlift, that's all going to help to you know build the stability through the hip. With the upper body, doing a single arm is going to create a little bit more rotation and put a little bit more isolation on one side. So both are good to do. I really like like double arm pulls because I think that stabilizes in the shoulder blades. Um, but it's also important to do the, the single arm. Um, and you can get you can vary it up as you go along. Uh, core exercises, crunches and sit-ups are out. Uh, dead bugs, planks all kinds of variations of planks, chops, pulls. Um, again, there's thousands of exercises, but some core exercise is important to do. I have gotten away altogether from doing crunches. There is some suggestion that doing that flex back injury uh, um, I don't know. I think if you can maintain a core, you're going to feel more of your, you you will feel your core work. And um, that that will work. More the uh, right. Femoris, which are not sorry, rectus, because that's where deeper muscles you can really your transverse abdominis. And that kind of is what really holds, stabilizes your back. These are the main six exercises, but again, there's a variety. In a, If you're working out twice a week, one day a week, I would recommend doing a two-legged squat. One day a week, do a single leg and vice versa along the whole section. One day you might do a anterior core like a regular plank. The next day you might do a side plank. If you have the time, add in both for both. For You know, you could do both of the an anterior and a posterior or a side plank. Um, doing some posterior core is also important. You know, it's the key is mix and match it. Um, 
I recommend usually people stay with a program for about four weeks. The way I set things up is you're going to do, I have two different workouts generally. Um, one is workout A and workout B and you'll alternate. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're going to do or Monday, you'll do A, Wednesday, you'll do B, Thursday, Friday, you'll do A again. So you'll alternate back and forth and then flip that the following week. Um, it There's not definitely a set um, time frame to do it. When kids are in season, if they can do a workout once or twice a week, that's awesome. So if they only have one, they, they, and they incorporate all of these exercises in there, that will help tremendously. Um, I don't think that it's beneficial. And I say this a lot that is beneficial. Well, let me backtrack. It is beneficial to do some strength work in practice. Um, but realistically, we're trying to improve our jumps. We're trying to learn new stunts. We're trying to add transitions. We're trying to learn the cheers and the dances, put it all together, um, prepare for game day. All of that, you know, you only have so long in a practice. And so then to add strength work at the end, like where do you fit that in? You're going to cut something short. Um, you can do an effective workout in 20 minutes that you have, you know, a warm up, a, a strength work, and then some stretching or conditioning at the end. But it makes it really hard. So training the kids to get into a routine outside of practice, I think is much more beneficial. The best time to do this workout, if it, you know, outside of practice is really either after practice or giving yourself enough time. So if you have practice at 6 p.m., maybe at 6 a.m. you do your workout. So you have some recovery time in the meantime. So they're not going from lifting at four o'clock and then doing a workout at six because they're that will set up for more injury. If they do their practice at six and they go to the gym at eight, that's better because then they're more tired from their work at, from their practice. They can go lighter through their strength work during season and during like busy competition. Ideally, we want like a, a periodization. So during season, twice a week is fine. Like one and do it on the off days, um, spread it out a little bit, try to make it away from practice. When we get into the slower season, you know, um, for I, I've never coached all star or cheerlead all star. Um, so I don't fully know the seasons, but I know, you know, the May, June time frame or the April to May time frame tends to be the world and they get really busy and chaotic. Um, that's not the time to ramp up the strength training, but right after that, give a little bit of rest and then ramp up into a more maybe two to four times a week, um, you know, or if you can't get that into your schedule, like for three to four times, and then you'll, you'll do more frequency that way. Um, if you're going to do, and for college kids, if you're, um, if they, if they're competing in the spring, then, you know, this between now and the spring is going to be really, really busy. And so that would be like a slower strength time. But when they come, you know, same thing, like I think summertime should be, if they're not cheering all-star, that should be the time to really build this good strength and foundation um, because then they're in condition when they come back and they've got that strength and that's when they can actually build so that they get through the beginning of fall and then move into winter season. Um, and cause it, it's, you know, between school and life and downtime, you know, it's hard to fit it all in. So if you can keep going and keep that going, keep a workout in twice a week during the busy time and then do more frequent during the not so busy time, it's better on your body. Outside of these strength um, exercises, you know, it is important to do conditioning. You can, the way I would structure a workout would be to do a warm up. Um, we'll, we really won't go through the details of that today, but in the, I will um, send you guys a basic workout uh, by PDF and you can have access to that through my app also with the videos. And that gives you a warm up and then goes through a workout. And then I don't think I put any conditioning in there, but basic stretching. So if you're going to do some conditioning outside of um, practice, you would do that before the stretching. So finish with a static stretch. The beginning of the workout is going to be a dynamic warm up, which is going to loosen the muscles up, take your body through its range of motion that you're going to be using, get into your strength work, and then finish with a stretch. 
if you are short on time, you're going to aim for as many reps as you can, or as many rounds as you can, um, and sets. So maybe it's, maybe you have one set that you can get through and that's okay. Whatever you can do for the reps that you're doing that day. If you can do more, great. If you have like 10 to 12, 20 minutes, do as many rounds as you can and cycle through the squat, the deadlift, the split, uh, the split squat, push the pull the core um, and spend that, you know, do a five minute warm up, 15 minute workout and a five minute stretch at the end. If you have an hour, then take your time a little bit longer and spend that time. And if you have time after you, um, the strength and get into your conditioning, I personally think, and this is a change because when I was coaching, I was like, you need, we need to do our strength work. We need to do our conditioning until I was at Holy Cross. And finally the kids were able to get into the strength room there and have a structured program. Then I didn't need to actually do the conditioning and the uh, strength work at practice. But before that, it would take up a lot of time. And I was like, all right, we're going to run. We're going to do our sprints. And it's a lot. We are the the work that we do is actually a lot of strength and conditioning work during a practice. Their heart rate gets up when they're jumping. Their heart rate gets up for those periods of time when they're in the, uh, when they're doing the routine. So, you know, I, you've got to weigh and judge, like, are they getting really tired? Should they stop stunting and tumbling? Maybe we do some conditioning, maybe we do some easy stretching. Like it's important to kind of judge if you're coaching where are they at in, in their physicality and, and when do they need to rest? Because when we push through and we're tired, it just shuts muscles off. And then that sets us up for more uh, fatigue or more injury. Um, frequency. So we talked frequency reps and sets. So again, if you're in a shorter period of time, and you don't have a lot of time to, uh, to spend, do as many reps or many sets as you can. Generally, for cheerleaders, working in the eight to 12, even 15 rep range is good. I like the eight to 12 range because I think that's going to focus a little bit more on um, muscle building, strength building. Um, when you get into the, the, you, the lower reps are going to focus a lot on strength. The higher reps are going to be a little bit more conditioning and toning. Um, all of it's going to tone muscles. Like there's no, everything is going to build and, and tone the muscles the heavier reps and the or the heavier weight and the lower reps, like into the three rep range and six to eight sets of a squat. Um, you know, you're going to, it's, it's going to train your body different for most cheerleaders, especially, you know, those that are new to exercise or, um, younger kids, like the eight to 12 rep range is where they need to be. If they can't do 12 reps, um, if they can't do eight reps, then they should drop the weight down. Um, and then it's too light to work and work on building up that rep range. If they can do like, if they're like, oh, I've just banged out 20 and it was super easy and I don't feel anything. It's way too easy for them. And they need to add some load to that. Kids can add load. It's okay. That's not going to stunt their growth. Um, but they have to do it with good form. So the problem with little kids lifting is they're going to just pick the weight up and just muscle through it and probably compensate somewhere. Somebody doesn't know what they're doing. They might do the same thing. Very often in the clinic, I see kids, you know, I have to stop them. I'm like, slow down. You take your time. It's not a race to get through the exercises. It's not going to make you any stronger. It's not gonna make you feel better. And you're still going to have to do more at the end. So slowing them down, making them watch their form, making sure they're breathing with the exercises and not holding the breath are key uh, components to a strength workout. Uh, this we're going to do. I... Thanks for listening to this episode of the Cheer Athlete Podcast. Don't forget when in doubt, breathe it out. Take life one step at a time. You can do anything that you put your mind to. And as my friend Drew Keller has said, you're responsible for your own vibes. So let's go get the day.